Welcome back to Dare to Care. We hope you're having fun. Some housekeeping announcements. Do remember to upvote your questions by using the Q&A button. We won't be able to answer all questions, but in consideration of time, your votes will help to guide us. I know there's a leaderboard contest, but do also refrain from asking duplicate questions and ask strong questions to our speakers, please. There's a contest launching at 12pm today at the contest section, so do go check it out. For information, we'll be having uh, events that are focused on community care from tomorrow to Wednesday. These events are highly recommended if you want to find out more about ComCare. You can check them out at the webinars tab for more information. Now, in today's session, we have our various healthcare scholars here with us. They will be sharing an a, a interactive journey in which is titled Walking in a Healthcare Professional Shoes. This event actually brings you on actual scenarios that you will encounter as a healthcare professional. There will be poll questions along the way, so do take note. Do remember the polls are at the right side of the Q&A tab. If you have questions along, as we go along, uh, no worries. We can have Q&A later where you can post the questions to our scholars. Now, without further delay, I'll pass the time to Grace and Jonathan. Grace and Jonathan, please. Hello, good morning everyone. Welcome to the segment of Walking in the Healthcare Professional Shoes. I am Grace, a year one NIP nursing student. Hi, and I'm Jonathan. I'm a year four physiotherapy student. So the objectives of this program are to understand how healthcare professionals work together in providing patient-centered care, understand the breadth of knowledge and the empathy healthcare professionals use when working with patients. Practice critical thinking skills to derive the best options for patients. So, without further ado, let's get started with the icebreaker, Guess My Profession. So, all you have to do is to look at the pictures and guess the profession. So, you have 20 seconds to do so. The poll, as mentioned, is on the right. The hint is also to look at the subtitle. So, this is our first question. And here are our, our options. So the correct option is actually medical social worker. So they support patients and their families by providing psychosocial assessments, to develop discharge plans that meet their post-hospitalization needs and help them to cope with financial, social, emotional, and health issues. So the next question is this. And here are the options. Okay, time's up. The correct option is actually occupational therapies. They design and implement activities to ensure maximum recovery and achieve optimum independence for patients who are physically impaired or who have lost the ability to perform daily tasks. So let's move on to the next question. Okay, time's up. The correct answer is actually nurse. So nurses are highly skilled and well-rounded profession with diverse responsibilities. They manage patients' care, train caregivers to provide basic care, educate patients and their family, assess patients' physical and mental well-being, to perform clinical procedures as well. So let's move on to the next question. Okay, time's up. So the correct answer is actually physiotherapies. 
So they help people affected by injuries, illness, or disability through movement and exercise, manual therapy, education, and advices. So this is our last question, question five. Okay, time's up. So the correct answer is actually diagnostic radiographer. So they specialize in delivering high quality imaging service that aids in diagnosis of illness and injuries. So now I'll pass the time to Jonathan to continue to uh, tell you more about other healthcare professionals. Thank you, Grace. So aside from the five allied health professions that she has shared, uh, we also have other allied health professions so we have the dietitian who assess and prescribe appropriate dietary treatment and nutrition care plans for patients. And then we also have the respiratory therapist who plan, evaluate, and integrate cardiac and pulmonary care for patients suffering from respiratory uh, conditions. And then next, we have the orthoptist who assess and treat patients who suffer from defective eye movement and coordination. And then we also have the prosthetist and orthoptist who provide care for patients who require artificial limbs or corrective and supportive devices to enhance their quality of life. Next, we also have the speech therapists who diagnose and provide treatments for patients suffering from voice problems, cognition, or swallowing issues. And we have the pharmacists who dispense and counsel patients on the uses and effects of their medications. Next, we also have the podiatrists who diagnose and treat conditions of the feet and lower limb, such as bone and joint disorders. And we also have the radiation therapists who use the state-of-the-art computerized equipment to accurately administer the prescribed radiation dosage accurately on cancer patients. And last but not least, we also have the healthcare administrator who are very important. They shape policy and direction and they also provide administrative support for clinical departments. So if you'd like to find out more, please do visit the care to go beyond website to learn about each of these allied health professions and also the healthcare administrator. So ultimately, this uh, event, sorry, this icebreaker is really to allow participants, you guys, to know that our healthcare professions are part of a multidisciplinary teams that provide holistic care and support to each patient. So subsequently, we're going to start this uh, case study, okay, whereby I'll take you through uh, different uh, stations to allow you to walk in the shoes of uh, different healthcare professions. Okay, so here's the case study. So Mrs. X is a 55-year-old grab driver. After her husband lost his job due to COVID-19, Mrs. X became the sole breadwinner of the family of four. She also has diabetes. One day, Mrs. X missed a step and fell down. Uh, although she felt some pain in her ankle, she managed to get up and went home. Once she was at home, Mr. X helped to put some medicated oil on her ankle and provided her with some plaster for the cuts she received. Mrs. X refused to seek medical treatment as she felt that it was too expensive and the medicated oil would do the trick. But other, after a few days, her ankle was not getting any better and one of her wounds started secreting a slimy pus. She decided to then visit the polyclinic near her house. So this is the case study, okay? So right now I'll be introducing the uh, role player here. So we have uh, the characters. We have uh, Cheryl who will be uh, playing as a patient, Mrs. X, and Amy will be uh, playing as the narrator for this uh, case study. And then at each station, the IC will be uh, playing as the healthcare professionals. Okay. So before we start, I'll just quickly run through the flow of program. Okay, so first, uh, Mrs. X will be brought to the uh, polyclinic in station one and two, okay, where you'll be seen by the nurse and also the diagnostic radiographer. And then after that, she will be subsequently admitted to the hospital, the acute hospital. Uh, so from station three, four, five, six, and seven, you'll see how Mrs. X, uh, Mrs. X get to interact 
interact with different allied health professions. And finally, in station eight and nine, you get to see how the allied health professions interact with her slightly differently in the community setting. All right, so be, uh, without further ado, let us uh, let the journey begin. Ingi, take it away. So hello everyone, congrats on taking the first step as a healthcare professional. So in our first station, you will be taking the role of a triage nurse at the polyclinic where Mrs X makes her first contact with the healthcare system after her fall. Good morning ma'am, I'm Nurse Jing Heng and I'll be attending to you for your visit today. Hello. So after introducing yourself, what would you ask Mrs X? A. Can you read out your name and NRIC, please? B. What are you here for today? Or C. Do you need to go to the toilet? The hall has opened on the right and you have 20 seconds to answer the question. Okay, we will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is A. At least two patient identifiers are required by healthcare professionals before administering treatment to patients. This is to verify that we are treating the right patient with the right orders. Identifiers can include the patient's full name, NRIC, or even their home addresses, as these are mostly unique to each individual. My name is Mrs. XYZ, and my NRIC is S1234567A. Thank you, Mrs. X. May I ask, what are you here for today? Uh, my ankle pain, uh, it looks like swollen, you know. I fell down three days ago and I thought the pain would go away, but it became worse. Now my legs swollen until I cannot walk. Oh my, that sounds terrible. If it is okay, can I assess the pain that you are feeling right now? So, as the nurse, how would you assess Mrs. X's pain? A. Can you press on my arm to, tell, to show me the pain you feel? B. Is the pain you feel very pain or not so pain? C. From a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being almost no pain and 10 being very unbearable pain, can you rate the pain you are feeling right now? The poll will be open for the next 20 seconds. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is C. A pain score allows us to understand the extent of the pain felt by patients. Visual aids can help patients to visualize the degree of pain associated with each score as well. We can then administer the right treatment and determine if the patient's condition is improving. For example, if the patient's pain score decreased from 7 to 3, the treatment plan for the patient is likely to be working. Uh, around 5 to 6, but sometimes when I take Panadol, then the pain will go away leh. I see. That must be very painful, right? We'll see how we can manage this pain that you feel. Now, I'll be taking your vital signs. So, which equipment is needed to take Mrs. X's vital signs? A poll has opened on the right and you have 20 seconds to answer. So we will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is D. We have to use all of the above equipment to measure the five vital signs of the patient. The vital signs that we are referring to include blood pressure, heart rate, respiration rate, temperature, and oxygen saturation levels. Any abnormal values in any of the vital signs can reveal information about the patient's overall health. Ah, uh, okay. So the vital signs of the patients have been taken and all are within the normal range. 
Mrs. X, now I'll be asking you a few questions related to your personal life. As the nurse, what kind of information would you like to gather about Mrs. X? One, medical history. Two, social history. Or three, financial history. You can choose a combination of options as well. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is A, medical and social history. A medical history is important as some medical conditions may have implications on the treatment required. A social history allows us to, to know what Mrs. X did on a daily basis and it gives us a clue on how the injury has and may affect her life. I have diabetes but no child allergies. La. I drive grad one, but now because of this, I haven't drive for three days already. After I fell down, I thought this injury will heal, so I never come see doctor. Very expensive one, you know. Oh, I understand where you're coming from now. But thank you for coming out to seek treatment, as we can help you recover and hopefully you'll be able to return to work as soon as possible. Now, I'll pass the information that you have given me to the doctor. You can wait in the waiting room until your number is called. Thank you, Mrs. X. Thank you, Ines. Congratulations. You have completed the first station as a triage nurse. With all of the information gathered, Mrs. X is ready to see her doctor for further diagnosis. Now, the doctor has examined Mrs. X and has ordered an X-ray for diagnosis of the issue. You are now playing the diagnostic radiographer at the polyclinic. Hello, here's my number. What I do are? As the diagnostic radiographer, what should you do next? A. Ask Mrs. X what are her hobbies. B. Introduce yourself. Ask Mrs. X what she has come for and confirm doctor's orders. Or C. Ask Mrs. X to position herself for x-ray as there are many other patients waiting. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll that has opened on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is B. It is important for us to let the patient know what is happening and what they are coming in for. Confirmation of doctor's orders is essential in preventing any medical errors. I am the radiographer and I'll be the one helping you take the action today. What? What radiographer? I don't know why is that. Leh. What does a radiographer do? Ah? So what do you think diagnostic radiographers do? A. Take pictures. B. Take scans that help doctors in diagnosing a problem. Or C. Talking to patients. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the current answer is B. Diagnostic radiographers help doctors to take x-rays, MRIs and ultrasounds. All of these are scans that I think most participants would have heard of. Other than that, diagnostic radiographers also take other scans such as nuclear me medicine imaging, which records radiation emitting from within the body. Fluoroscopy shows a continuous X-ray image where X-ray beams is passed through the body to make an X-ray video. Interventional radiography, as the name suggests, is used in minimally invasive procedures to perform both diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. Oh wow, you all do so many things, Wana. Yeah, we Wow, I don't know eh. Is it polyclinic ah? We do work in the polyclinic, but in many other departments too. 
to be able to finance anywhere that requires diagnostic imaging of the body. Oh, so they are work in a lot of places lah. But they are sounds very boring eh. Every day only take pictures. No, Mrs. X, there's a lot of soft skills involved too. So, what are some soft skills a diagnostic, radio diagnostic radiographer requires? A. To know how to post for pictures. B. To communicate. Or C. To be physically strong so that they can turn their patients to their positions. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct option is B, communication. As a radiographer, you meet people from all ages and all backgrounds. Therefore, you have to develop good communication skills. Besides communication, you have to be very alert. There are times where doctors like to order a whole lot of x-rays for a single patient, of which most of the time, they are unnecessary. As a diagnostic radiographer, you need to be alert and to inform the doctor as we do not want to expose the patient to too much unnecessary radiation. Wow, being a DR is not easy, ah. Yep. Anyway, Mrs. X, I see a doctor has ordered an X-ray for your ankle. May I know what has happened? Uh, I fell down from the stairs not long ago. Then my right foot got some blue bags and got cuts. Because okay one la, not very pain la, tahan. But afterwards la, wow, very very pain, then become swollen eh. Now I'm very worried, so I come see doctor law. Oh my right oh. Okay, so I'll be taking the issue of before we start, can I confirm with you your full name and NRIC? Hi, uh, Ken Ken. Uh, my name is Mrs. X and my NRIC is S1234567. Okay, let's proceed to the x ray then. Mrs. X, could you lie down straight for me? Uh, straight, uh. okay, okay. As we are preparing to take the scan, how do you think the diagnostic videographer should ask Mrs. X to position? A. Mrs. X, could you lie down flat on the x-ray table with both of your legs straight out? Put your right ankle flat on the black plastic film. B. Mrs. X, could you lie down and put the side of your ankle on the cassette? C. Mrs. X, could you lie down and position yourself? You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is A. Option A gives the clearest uh, instructions and guides, guides the patient in their positioning. Option B contains some medical jargon, and patients may not understand the instructions given. Option C is uh, the instructions aren't clear enough to facilitate proper positioning. Uh, okay, can I learn up properly? La? and do not move while the x-ray is being taken. Okay, the x-ray is taken. Wow, so fast ah. Oh yeah, why is this wrong thing you're wearing ah? So what is, what is the diagnostic radiographer wearing? A, a keychain, B, a name badge, or C, a radiation monitoring badge? You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is C, the radiation monitoring badge. What is it for? Involves ionizing radiation, which may be harmful in some 
yoga how to wear this badge. We have this is a piece of yoga film that is sent to to x rays for radiation. And the film in these badges is processed to determine how much radiation HDR is actually exposed to. Wow, this is interesting and also cute. Huh? It's nice talking to you, radiographer. It was nice talking to you, too, Mrs. X. We will now proceed to wait outside room 25 for the review of X-ray with the doctor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So after taking the X-ray of her foot, Mrs. X could go back to her doctor to get her X-ray review. Good job, everyone. So after the X-ray was taken and revealed no fracture, the polyclinic doctor referred Mrs. X to an orthopedic doctor in a hospital. The orthopedic doctor ordered for an MRI for Mrs. X. Hello, hello. The doctor asked me to come here. What do I need to do? Ah? Hello, I'm diagnostic radiographer Rainy. I'll be helping to take MRI for you. Can I check for your full name and NRIC, please? My name is Mrs. X and my NRIC is S1234567A. Okay, did the doctor tell you what are you here for? Yeah, he said I need to do a scan on my right ankle oh, because I fell down, then now it is very swollen and painful. Okay, Mrs. X, yes, we are going to do an MRI for you so that we can see if you tore any part of your ankle because your x ray showed no fracture. Now, can you please fill in this MRI safety questionnaire first? So I just answer yes, no, can we do, huh? That's right, Mrs. X, and tick the bottom part as well if they apply to you. If you need any help, feel free to ask me. Okay, Ken, thank you, Lara. Although simple, it is very important for patients to fill in this form before the MRI for their personal safety. I'm done now. Okay, Mrs. X, you can proceed to change into the gown prepared in a changing room while I prepare the relevant things for your MRI. The patient has to change into a gown, but do you know why? A. Patient safety and ensures no blockage while taking a scan. B. It looks pretty and the gown is more cooling. C. The gown is cleaner than the patient's own clothes. The poll has opened on the right and you have 20 seconds to answer. We will now be closing the poll and the current answer is A. The MRI machine can only scan accurately if there is nothing blocking it and it prevents any unwanted reactions between the machine and any of the patient's items. So what do you think can be brought into the MRI room? A. Contact lens B. Metallic items or C. Dangerous Again, you have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is A. The MRI is like a big magnet, so all metallic items like pacemakers or leg chains have to be removed for the MRI. Another type of scan has to be done if there, needs, if there are unremovable metallic items. Contact lenses are safe for the MRI. Okay, Mrs. X, so you just have to remove your spectacles before you enter since you stated no for almost all the questions in the form just now. But let me just double check to see if you have any metallic items with you. Uh, okay, Ken. Ayo, is it scary inside? I'm very scared of being in a closed place. Eh? The tube looks very dark and scary, oh my god. Not to worry, Mrs. X, you don't have to put your head inside just the bottom part of your body because only your ankle is needed for the scan. It is important to reassure patients and enable them to know the necessary information regarding the scan that they will be taking. After discussing the necessary information, 
Mrs. X and the diagnostic radiographer enters the MRI room. So what are things that cannot be brought into the MRI scan later? A, headphones, B, earplugs, or C, a handphone. We're now be closing the poll. The answer is C. Headphones and your plugs are required since it can be quite loud when the scan starts. Handphones, on the other hand, will only react with the machine, leading to unwanted consequences and thus must not be brought into the MRI room. Okay, Mrs. X, here is the headphone and your plugs for you to wear because it will be quite loud. There is a casing surrounding the MRI machine. What's the use of the casing around the MRI machine? A, for aesthetic purposes. B, to contain the magnetic fields required for the scan so that they won't affect any other metallic items. Or C, to prevent the patient from escaping. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is B. There are three kinds of magnetic fields for the MRI, namely the static, radio frequency, and gradient magnetic fields, and all of these can affect the function of metallic issues. The casing is there to prevent any of these issues. Besides the casing, there is a special type of copper door uh, in M there are special copper MRI doors, and they perform similar purposes as well. 30 minutes later, okay, Mrs. X, the MRI scan is done. You can leave the room now. After the results are out, I'll upload into the system so that the doctor can see it and explain to you about your condition. For now, you can just change out of your gown and make an appointment to see the doctor a few days later for the results. Thank you. Thank you, Lai Dynasty Radiographer. You really helped me feel more at ease. So after the doctor saw the scan, they realized that Mrs. X had a partial ligament tear. Mrs. X would undergo a ligament reconstruction surgery as advised by the doctor. The doctor also noted that the scratches Mrs. X got was not properly treated. Hence, they sent Mrs. X to a wound nurse. Thanks to the diagnostic radiographer, Mrs. X finally found the cause of her swollen ankle from the MRI and she can now receive proper targeted treatment. Good job, everyone. So after the MRI scan, the doctor has realized that the scratches were not properly dressed yet. Hence, Mrs. X doctor ordered the nurse to apply wound dressings for her injuries. So ask the nurse, what is the first thing you should do? A, approach the patient. B, check the electronic health record. Or C, prepare the equipment. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is B. Check the electronic health record. The electronic health record contains patient history, doctor's orders, and medical treatment plans. By understanding our patient, we are able to provide appropriate care for them. Good morning, Mrs. X. I am Nurse Elizabeth, and today I'll be helping you with your dressing on your left ankle. So before that, may I know if you're allergic to any dressing materials? What is dressing materials? Uh? Oh, Mrs. X, our dressing materials are like gauze and cotton balls, etc. Uh, no, Missy, you don't have. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Mrs. X. Um, so now I'll be preparing the equipment, and I'll be back with you shortly. So here's the call bell in case you need any assistance. 
So, after leaving the patient, what is the first thing you will need to do? A. Prepare the equipment or B. Perform hand hygiene. You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is B, perform hand hygiene. After approaching the patient, hand hygiene must be done in order to minimize the risk of transmission of microorganisms between the healthcare worker, patient and the environment. There are five moments of hand hygiene where healthcare workers need to observe, which are firstly, before touching the patient, secondly, before clean or aseptic procedure, Third, after body fluid risk exposure. Fourth, after touching a patient. And fifth, after touching a patient's surrounding or environment. Now we will start preparing the equipment. Which of the dressing set will you choose? A or B? This is a clue, look closely. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is A. The dressing set A expires in 2025 while dressing set B has already expired in 2020. When preparing equipment like dressing sets, we need to check for D, I and E, discoloration, integrity and the expiry date. Now let's watch a short video on how to dress the wound. So I've already prepared my trolley. I've made sure I've cleaned it down prior to doing this task with Clinelle wipes. I have some hand sanitizer and all my other equipment and my waste disposal here. One of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to raise this bed to a good working height for myself to protect my back. Very good. And I have a bluey here, which I'm just going to pop under the patient near the wound area to catch any exudates or dripping that occurs while I clean the wound. I'm going to grab my dressing pack, making sure it's in date as well. And get that all set up. So my first fold out is going to be away from myself. For this particular type of dressing pack, the second one will be towards myself, then to the right and to the left, following the tabs. Going to tip it out carefully. Grabbing my cleaning solution. Again, taking care not to lean over my field too much more than necessary and put my solution in the little tray there. So I'm going to do it from a good height, approximately 10 centimetres, not so high that it splashes everywhere, but not so low either that I break my sterile field. I'm also going to get my dressing and pop it in the tray there. Um, whatever's going to be most appropriate for your wound at the time, for today we're going to use this product. Going to do some more hand hygiene. Making sure, of course, before I've started this task, I make sure that I am bare below the elbows, no watches or rings, and that I've done a procedural hand wash as well. Okay. 
going to carefully pick up one pair of my tongs without touching anything else and then use that first pair to pass my second pair of forceps to my other hand. Then I can freely place things where they need to be, popping my cotton balls in the solution. I've got my drying gauze and a sterile towel is there for use. Making sure your cotton balls are nice and wet with the solution, not drying them out too much because the wetness is what's going to actually help get the solution into the wound and give it a really good clean. So I want to clean it nice and fairly firmly so that we're actually getting all of the debris and other matter off. And this is why analgesia beforehand is really important. Notice too that I'm working in a circular motion for this type of wound, cleaning from the inside out and making sure that I clean the peri wound as well as the wound bed itself. Always be careful too when you pop your waste in the bin that you don't accidentally contaminate yourself by touching the trash, can, the trash bag. And I'm going to dab my wound dry. And because I'm finished with my tongs for the moment, I'm just going to pop them to one side on the edge of my sterile field, handles facing out. With my dressing that I've already grabbed out. They are designed so that the inside can remain sterile while you apply the dressing. So I'm going to very carefully take the backing away without touching the inside. This part might be slightly trickier depending on where you're dressing and apply. Obviously every area is a little bit different to dress, but trying to avoid where possible creases in the dressing um, as this will let in potential microbes and moisture, things like that, which is not ideal for the longevity of the dressing. We have now watched the video of how um, to dress a wound, and I will be asking some questions about the video. So first, when opening the dressing set, which fold should you open first? A, the fold towards you, or B, the fold away from you? You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the answer is B, the fold away from you. This is to ensure that all the sterile, this is to ensure surgical asepsis and there is no crossing of the sterile field. One's body and hand should never extend over a sterile field. Now, how should you clean the round wound? A, from inside to outside or B, from outside to inside? You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is B, uh, A, inside to outside. The wound is cleaned from the least to most contaminated portion in order to avoid introducing new pathogens or microbes. So to recall.
Okay, thank you, Mrs. X. We are finished with your wound dressing. May I know if you need anything else? Thank you so much, Missy. Uh, may I know how much this will be? Uh, it will be about $30. Oh, wow, so expensive. Uh. I'm the only person working in my family, but now I'm hospitalized, so I can't work. I don't know how I will pay for the hospital bills. I see, Mrs. X. So from what I'm hearing, you are feeling stressed uh, because of your financial problems, right? Uh, yes, I'm very stressed. Oh, okay, Mrs. X. Uh, in that case, uh, can I refer you to our hospital's medical social worker? She'll be able to further advise and support you. Uh, okay, thank you so much, Missy. You're welcome, Mrs. X. Thank you, everyone, for helping Mrs. X with her wound dressing on her ankle. The wound is now clean and free from infection. Wonderful job. Now, welcome to the medical social worker station. Mrs. X has come to you after she was referred to you because of some, having some financial difficulties. Hi, Mrs. X. I am Chloe and I'm the medical social worker who will be helping you today. Before we begin, may I check with you for your full name and NRIC? Hi, Chloe. My full name is Mrs. X, 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 Y, Z and my NRIC is S1234567A. Thank you, Mrs. X. Can you share with me more about what brings you here today? Actually, I told the doctor I got no money to pay him. Then he asked me to come see you. Is it help me pay? <laughs> uh, Mrs. X, I cannot help you to pay. But what I can do for you is to look through some schemes together with you to provide you with some necessary financial assistance. So could you tell me more about yourself? Actually, oh, I do grad one. Then because of COVID, I cannot fire, then cannot find job. Uh, it's been very hard la, because my family only got me earning money. Then I feel very stressed and sad. Like, I disappoint my family, you know. So now everybody also like not very happy, it made me feel a little more sad. Mrs. X has just shared her concerns with you. As a medical social worker, what would be the best course of action to take to support Mrs. X right now? A. Refer the case to a family service centre in the community. B. Apply for financial assistance for Mrs. X. Or C. Find out more about Mrs. X's family background and financial situation. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is C. A case management approach helps patients to identify and prioritize the issues that we need to work on. In this scenario, we can see that the patient has several concerns, her financial situation, her emotional difficulties due to her loss of employment and its impact on her family. Medical social workers aim to find out more about the patient so that we can find the best possible way to support them. Mrs. X's financial problems seem to be troubling her the most. However, it is not the only concern present. A case management approach would then allow us to understand her situation better and address her situation completely. Thank you so much. Uh. Actually, other than my hospital fee haul, I'm quite worried about my day-to-day -day expenses. My children so young, I don't know when can discharge. I think on no job. Now I feel like this, comfort cannot drive great already. If I don't drive, then go what other jobs for me. Every day I think about this kind of thing, I cannot sleep, you know. After hearing over what Mrs. X said, what can you do to support Mrs. X? A. Speak with the physiotherapist or occupational therapist to find out about her rehabilitation potential. B. Refer her to the social service office. Or C. Refer her for job coaching, career matching support. You have 20 seconds to answer on the right.
will not be closing the poll and the correct answer is A. The medical social worker's responsibility includes following up with members of the healthcare team to find out about the level of care needed for the patient and to understand the patient's condition and progression. This knowledge allows us to understand how much support the patient requires while in the hospital and allows us to arrange for any necessary support upon her discharge. Wow, thank you, thank you. I think I am recovering. Uh, there will be some times where I don't feel so good about myself. Is there anything you can help me with that? So what else can you do to support Mrs. X's mental health concerns? A. Refer her to a family service centre after discharge. B. Offer psychosocial support and refer her to community agencies for counselling. Or C. Speak to her husband and her family. The poll has opened on the right and you have 20 seconds to answer. We are now be closing the poll and the correct answer is B. Offering psychosocial support, exploring concerns and validating the patient's feelings are beneficial for them. While referral to community agencies post-discharge can offer similar support, um, this is not a fo focus at this point of time. Wow, I feel a lot better now. Thank you for listening to me and helping me with my problems. Through this conversation with Mrs. X, we have been able to understand her financial and emotional concerns. With this knowledge, MSWs can help to advocate for the patient and communicate with the other healthcare professionals involved, such that they will be able to understand Mrs. X's situation. So thanks to the medical social worker, Mrs. X feels a lot better and is less worried now. So welcome to the pharmacy station. After seeing the medical social worker, the pharmacist came to do a prescription check with Mrs. X prior to her discharge. Hi Mrs. X, I'm Jolene. A pharmacist here to give you your medications before you go home. Can I confirm what is your full name, NRIC, and if you have any drug allergies? Uh, my name is Mrs. X and my NRIC is S1234567A. I have no drug allergies. Okay. May I ask what is the illness that you are being treated for in the hospital now? Uh, I have diabetes and I am here because of the wound on my ankle. Sorry, uh, can you please hurry? My children is waiting for me and I don't want to hold them up. Okay, Mrs. X, I'll try my best to give you your medications as soon as possible. We just wish to check to ensure that these medications are safe and effective for you to use at home. May I ask, do you know what medications you've been taking the past few days in the hospital? Uh, I told the doctor already. Need to ask again. Uh. Yes, Mrs. X. I just wish to double confirm that you're currently taking what you're currently taking tallies with the records and to see how familiar you are with these medications. I see. So I've been taking four medications. First one, of course, is my diabetes drug, my formula. Uh, the one I take when I eat breakfast and dinner. Then the second one is the antibiotic. I forgot what name that. Uh, the third one is the ibuprofen for my pain and swelling anchor. And the last one is omniprazole, also for the pain lab. At this point, you realise that Mrs. X might have a misunderstanding about one of her medications. What should you do? A. Ignore the patient's mistake. So long as she takes her medication, it's okay. B. Correct her. Let her know the correct purpose of taking the drug. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We'll now be closing the poll and the correct answer is B. It is important for the patients to know the correct indication for the drugs to reduce non-adherence caused by misconceptions. If she knows what the drug is for, she can better manage her condition and adhere to the medication as ordered. Yes, Mrs. X, you got all the four drugs correct. 
However, I would just like to bring to your attention the drug omeprazole. It is actually not for your pain. It is to protect your stomach. Taking ibuprofen increases the risk of stomach ulcer and omeprazole helps to protect your stomach lining. So, as long as you are taking ibuprofen, it is important that you take omeprazole too. Oh, I did not know omeprazole was to protect my stomach. Uh, thank God you told me, if I go home, then no pain. I will not take the omeprazole. Then your consequences will be disastrous. So, what are some important drug information you would like to give Mrs. X? A. Side effects. B. Threats to overdosing. C. Strength of drug and dosage. D. Special instructions. E. Importance of medication compliance. Or F. Food to go with medications. There are more than one right answer. We're now closing the poll. Actually, all of these are important information that the pharmacists have to relay to their patients. However, things such as side effects, strength and dosage, special instructions, and importance of medication compliance are essential for the pharmacists to relay to all their patients. Um, can I just ask, can I not take the antibiotic medications? You see how many already no more yellowish thing come out. And I also no fever or whatsoever. I don't think I need to take the antibiotics. I can save some money also. As the pharmacist, how should you respond? A. Sure, I will talk to the doctor to see if the antibiotics can be stopped. B. Maybe I will go and double check the orders again. There might have been a mistake. C. No. You have to complete the antibiotic course to ensure that you killed off all the bacteria that previously caused your infection. D. Sure, your comfort and preference matters most to us. Since you don't have any symptoms, it's okay for you to stop taking the antibiotics. You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is C. Antibiotics should not be stopped abruptly and must be completed, according to the well-studied protocols, even if the patient is already feeling better. Are you very sure, pharmacist? I really got no money already, and my children need their pocket money. Anyway, I no more fever already, and the yellow thing also no more already. I don't need to eat the antibiotics, so it should be okay one lah. Last time I do that, nothing happened to me also. As you can see, giving the answers sometimes might not be enough to calm the patient down. It is advisable to acknowledge the patient's feeling to display understanding before answering the patient's question. It is great news that your fever has subsided and there is no more pus in your wound, Mrs X. However, there's still a possibility of surviving bacteria gaining antibiotic resistance. And hence, it'll be much tougher to treat and we'll have to start you on stronger antibiotics in the future. Oh, I understand already. So you are saying if I don't finish the antibiotics, so then in the future, it will be harder to treat because the antibiotics that was used will not, use, will not work anymore, right? That's right, Mrs. X. Wow, so serious. Uh. Okay, okay, I better take the medications. After watching the pharmacist interact with Mrs. X, what do you think are some of the good qualities a pharmacist should possess? A. Persuasive and gentle. B. Patient, detail oriented, empathetic, and encouraging. Or C. Sharp and critical above all. You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right.
We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is B. Patient detail oriented, empathetic and encouraging. So thanks to the pharmacist, Mrs. X now understands the medication she has to continue taking following her discharge. Her doubts were clarified and she is confident in managing her own medication taking. Good job. After, after the, the doctor's, doctor's, diagn after the doctor's doctor. diagnosis, Mrs. X underwent ligament reconstruction surgery for her affected ankle. She will now see the physiotherapist at the hospital to begin her rehabilitation journey. Hello, Mrs. X. I'm your physiotherapist for today. What can I do for you today? Hello, physiotherapist. Can you help me do something about my ankle? I really hope that the pain in my ankle will lessen, and I will also want to be able to walk independently ASAP. From the short conversation with Mrs. X, the following information was obtained. She had ligament reconstruction surgery two days ago, and she still has pain in her affected ankle. She hopes to be able to walk independently. As the physiotherapist, should massage or strengthening exercises be first described to Mrs. X? A. The massage or B. Strengthening exercises. You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the current answer is B, strengthening exercises. Physiotherapists typically use exercise as the first and fundamental form of treatment. Treatments such as massage are considered adjuncts, which can be a component of the rehabilitation process but should not be treated as the main mode of treatment. That's great. I was informed by the doctor that I should not be placing any weight on my affected ankle. Is it possible to move around after surgery? Mobility aids, such as crutches and walking sticks, would help to transfer the body weight away from Mrs. X's injured ankle, allowing her to move about post-surgery. So which mobility aid do you think is most appropriate for Mrs. X? A. A walking stick, B. Auxiliary crutches, or C. A wheelchair? You have 20 seconds to answer the question on the right. We will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is B, axillary crutches. These mobility aids help to transfer the weight away from the injured, and injured leg while allowing the patient to move around more independently. The axillary crutches offer the greatest space of support to stabilize Mrs. X. Now, in addition to the mobility aids, Mrs. X will also need exercises to strengthen her muscles. Which exercise would you prescribe to her? A, straight leg raises. B, push-ups, or C, jumping jacks. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is A, straight leg raises. Straight leg raises would help to strengthen Mrs. Mrs. X's leg muscles without aggravating her ankle injury. Physiotherapists prescribe exercises to strengthen the muscles in patients while ensuring that the injury does not worsen. Okay, this should help me strengthen my leg muscles but not aggravate my injury. Thank you so much physiotherapists. With the crutches and exercises prescribed to Mrs. X, her condition gradually improved and she was able to move about more independently. Good job. And now the community nurse seeing Mrs. X at her home. After Mrs. X was discharged, she was referred to the community nurse. In the referral letter, the doctor mentioned that her sugar level has been high and the patient has been defaulting her medical appointments. The doctor also requested a community nurse to help assess and dress her wound to prevent infection. Hey 
Hello, Mrs. X. I'm a community nurse, Elaine. There is a sign to your case. How have you been? Hey, Dad, there are so many things going on. It's been so stressful. Oh, dear. It must have been a tough time for you. Is there anything I can help you with? Oh, thank you so much. I will, you know, uh, so many people tell me so many things. I'm so confused about so many medications, appointments, and I'm afraid that my mood will not heal properly. No worries, Mrs. X. Let's work things out together. Okay, thank you so much. So I understand there are so many things going on. We can look at it one by one and find a solution that you're comfortable with. Sounds great. Thank you. No problem, Mrs. X. There are a couple of things we want to do today. Firstly, I hope to find out more about your situation. So far, I understand that you have been defaulting on your medical appointment. I also understand that you recently got injured and needed help on your own dressing. Uh, yes, yes. You know they asked me to check my wound and do some cleaning. But I'm so scared to see my own wound. No worries. Which one do you want me to assist you with first? Mm, first, uh, maybe the medical appointment first? Mrs. X has chosen A. Why did she didn't attend? Was your visit to the doctor lately? Did the doctor speak to you about your condition? Oh, I find it very hard to communicate with my doctor. I only understand Chinese and my doctor keeps speaking to me in English. It is also too troublesome and far to go to the hospital for a visit. As the community nurse, what would you do to make things easier for Mrs. X? A. See if family members can follow her or B, refer to the nearest polyclinic for follow-up. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. Okay, we will now be closing the poll. Just to let everyone know, there is actually no correct answer. There is no perfect solution uh, and both of these solutions can work. However, it is essential that the patient is comfortable with and will be able to comply with the solution you choose. If you want to ask if family members can follow her, um, the family members can be an advocate for the patient and ensure that there's someone else to understand the procedures and keep track of doctor's instructions. Again, we have to ask the patient if she is comfortable with this arrangement. Otherwise, referring her to a nearest to a nearer polyclinic for a follow-up can also help as it seems that it's too far and too troublesome for Mrs. X to travel all the way back to the hospital. So Mrs. X, are you okay with this solution? Yes, this sounds like a better plan. After discussing about her appointments, the nurse will now proceed to discuss about wound care for Mrs. X. Mrs. X, before I end the session, may I assess your wound to see if there's any sign of infection and subsequently proceed to clean your wound? Thank you, nurse. It's been two days since I last opened my wound to check. I, I'm too scared to see any blood. Oh, I see, Mrs. X. Don't worry. Let me assess your wound and shortly after, I'll be cleaning your wound now. It may hurt a little. Let me know if you face any discomfort, okay? Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, Mrs. X. I'll be, proceed I'll be cleaning your wound now. So, is there any pain so far? Uh, no, don't hurt. Okay, Mrs. X. All is done. So far, the wound is healing quite well. But just a gentle reminder, try to keep the wound dry and intact. When you shower, you can cover it with a plastic bag to avoid getting the wound wet. Ah, uh, okay. I will take note. Okay, Mrs. X. So I will visit you in two days' time to recheck on the wound. 
So is there any other things that you want me to help you with? Uh, okay, thank you. I want to return back to work as soon as possible. However, I remember that I cannot remember the exercises. Ah, I see. Not to worry, Mrs. X. Is it okay I refer you to my fellow colleagues, the physiotherapist, occupational therapist, to come and guide you? Oh, that would be great. Thank you. So thank you for helping Mrs. X. As a community nurse, we are here to step into their boat, understand patients' needs, help them in everything we can by collaborating with other allied health professionals in order to provide a comprehensive health, a comprehensive environment. After talking to the community nurse, Mrs. X has started attending all her appointments regularly. Her wound has also gradually improved. Now, Mrs. X has regained full weight-bearing status and basic mobility. Upon referral from the community nurse, she is now visiting a physiotherapist and occupational therapist in the community hospital. Mrs. X first enters the room to meet the physiotherapist. Upon entering the room, she sees the physiotherapist seated in the room. Body language matters. How do you think the physiotherapist is looking like? You have 20 seconds to answer the poll on the right. I will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is C. Regardless of your healthcare profession, it is important to carry yourself well. Leaving a good first impression is key to building trust with our patients. Small details like our body and sitting posture does matter. Sitting upright in an open posture is a display of your willingness to listen to what your patient has to share. Option A portrays a slouching posture, which may be perceived as disinterested. Having your arms crossed like an option B can be perceived as a sign of authority. By sitting upright and in an open posture, it shows your interest in the patient. Now that the patient and physiotherapist have met, how should the physiotherapist first communicate to the patient? A. Hi Mrs. X, how are you feeling today? Can you tell me more about your food? B. Hi Mrs. X, what's wrong with you today? Why are you here? C. Hi Mrs. X, the hospital says you have a slight ankle dis instability. Today I will be working with you on this. You have 20 seconds to answer the poll that has opened on the right. I will now be closing the poll, and the correct answer is A. Option A entails an open-ended question, which allows Mrs. X to openly share about her recovery process. This allows the, the physiotherapist to get a better overview of the patient's condition. Option B may sound too hostile or patronizing to some patients. This may cause the patient to become more distant and less willing to share. Option C portrays the physiotherapist as an authority figure who does not discuss the treatment plan with the patient. It is important that designing treatment plans should be a collaborative effort between both the patient and the therapist. Evolving the patient is key to ensuring compliance and commitment to the treatment plan. Hi Mr. Sex, how are you feeling today? Can you tell me more about your food? Hello PT, I'm fine. My food is getting better after following the exercises that the hospital PT taught me. I can move it more and walk better now. I think I'm ready to return to work. I see. That's great. Let me perform a physical examination to see how well we've improved. The physiotherapist will perform various physical examinations to test for the patient's ankle strength, mobility, balance, and range of movement. Wow, it seems you have been recovering well. I understand that your goal is to recover quickly and return back to driving. 
Based on my examination, I see that you're still facing ankle instability and a trouble accomplishing full range of motion. Accomplishing common walking patterns and maintaining balance is also a bit of a challenge for you. So we will be working together to come up with a treatment plan. Upon completing several weeks of therapy in the community hospital, Mrs. X is now more or less able to return to work. The physiotherapist refers her to the occupational therapist to assess her ability to return to driving. Occupational therapist, I want to return to work as soon as possible. I am my family so breadwinner. The physiotherapist said my leg is a lot better now, but I still need to see before I can return to work. Can you help me to check? Hi, Mrs. X. Definitely. I'm happy to see that you are able to walk independently now. My job is to design activities for you to achieve specific day-to-day -day movements and assess your readiness to return to work. Can I see your ankle? Hi there. Mrs. X wants to return to work. During the assessment, which movement should we test for? A. Scenario-based activities such as emergency braking. B. The ankle range of movement. Or C. Mrs. X's squat strength. You have 20 seconds to answer the following question. We will now be closing the poll and the correct answer is A, scenario-based activities. Occupational therapists focus on facilitating patients back to their specific occupation or activity, assessing her competency to perform what her occupation requires rather than her strength or range of movement is, much, is of a much greater importance. Great, seems like you've been recovering well. I will be helping you to apply for Driving Assessment and Rehabilitation Service, known as DAS, where I will join you for an onward driving assessment to determine your readiness. Here's a DAS brochure for you. So DAS is available for patients with valid class 3 or 3A license who wish to return to driving after acquiring medical conditions. Together with a rehabilitation trained driving instructor, I will conduct an on and in-car, off-road and on-road assessment for you in a vehicle with dual braking control. And depending on the results, we, have to, we may have to modify our vehicle or for you to attend driving rehabilitation sessions with a driving instructor. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Now we have come to the end. We have come to the last station for a quick recap of the station so far. You guys first follow a nurse at the triage at the polyclinic, the diagnostic radiographer at polyclinic, then in the hospital. You all follow a nurse, medical social worker, pharmacist, physiotherapist at the hospital, followed by the nurses at the community setting, physiotherapist and occupational therapist in the community setting. As you can see, in order to provide patients with the best care possible, there needs to be a coordinated effort between members of the multidisciplinary team. So what you guys have just experienced is merely a glimpse of how it would be like. The other health, allied health professionals, which Jonathan shared earlier that are not covered in this journey, also play a part in making a difference in patients' life. For more information about the respective disciplines, there is an e-brochure which can be downloaded from the exhibitor booth under files. Alternatively, you may also check out the Healthcare Scholarship website at www.healthcarescholarships.sg slash healthcare disciplines. Now, let us have a mini poll quiz to accumulate participation points. Please use the poll function to answer. The questions are really easy, so we will be testing you on your speed. So you have about 10 seconds for each question. So the first question is, are we allowed to gather personal history, uh, be it medical, social, from a patient during triage? A, yes, only relevant history. B, no, it's confidential. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the correct answer is A. Next question. So, why do we need to get the history of a patient's current complaint when taking an x-ray? A, to get the correct positioning. B, for fun. You have 10 seconds to answer. The time is up. 
And the answer is A, to get the correct positioning. Next. So next question, which of the following is one of the job scope of diagnostic radiographers? A, X-ray, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine imaging, fluoroscopy, interventional radiography, and B, X-rays, MRI, ultrasound, nuclear medicine imaging, teach strengthening exercises, and interventional radiography. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the answer is A. Strengthening exercises are in fact done by physiotherapists. Next question. So what do you need to check for the dressing set before performing the procedure? A. Discoloration, integrity, and expiry date. B. Disintegration, indications, and expiry date. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the answer is A. Next question. So what kind of techniques should the nurse adopt when cleaning the wound for a patient? A, inside to outside. B, right to left. C, no special technique. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the answer is A, inside to outside. Hope you got that right. Next question. What are some situations that the medical social worker is able to provide help in? A, unemployment, financial difficulties, emotional concerns. B, unemployment, financial difficulties, breaking up with partner. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is the poll has ended and the answer is still A. Unemployment, financial difficulties, and emotional concerns. Next question, please. So why does the pharmacies need to educate the patient on their medications? A to allow patient to better manage their condition, and B to allow patient to prescribe their medications to others. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the answer is A, to allow the patient to better manage their condition. So, what is a common treatment that physiotherapists usually adopt? A, strengthening exercises, and B, massage. These are repeat questions, so you guys should be getting it correct. Okay, three more seconds. And the poll is now closed. The correct answer is A, strengthening exercises. So next question. As a community nurse, how can we help a patient who refuses to take his medications regularly? A, get the family members to help. B, leave the patient alone. You have 10 seconds to answer. The poll is now closed and the answer is A, get the family members to help. It's important to do everything in the interest of the patient and to help them on the journey of recovery. So next question. So what is the job scope for an occupational therapist? A, facilitate independent learning. B, regaining strength and mobility using various therapy techniques. The poll is now open for 10 seconds. The poll is now closed and the answer is A, facilitate independent learning. So now we have come to an end of the, the poll. So we hope that you guys have fun in the mini quiz. With the interest of our patients in mind as healthcare professionals, there's always a need for discharge planning to enable our patients to return back to their daily lives, to work, to participate in sports and to do the things that they enjoy. So this integrated chain of care aims to be cohesive from an acute to rehabilitative, then community setting, drawing parallels to the three beyonds directed by the Ministry of Health, beyond healthcare to health, beyond hospital to community, beyond quality to value for quality healthcare in Singapore. As this walking with the healthcare professionals section come to an end, we hope that you guys have a better understanding of what healthcare professionals do. 
we not only journey with our patients through their highs and lows, but are also privileged and equipped in a position to touch their lives, to acknowledge their worries, and to empower them towards their individual goals, celebrating milestones along the way. So now I'll be passing the time to Jia Ying for the Q&A. Hi everyone, thank you for all the speakers who shared about the various case studies and what healthcare professionals do encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. I'm sure now many of you have burning questions to ask our fellow healthcare students. So right now we will proceed on to the Q&A session. My name is Jia Ying and I'm a year three pharmacy student from the National University of Singapore. And I'm the moderator for this Q&A session today. So today we have representatives from MOHH and various healthcare disciplines. So from MOHH, we have Mr. Nigel, who is one of our, one of our scholarship officers. And from occupation, occupational therapy, we have Ying Yi. From physiotherapy, we have Li Yi and Jonathan. From nursing, we have Elizabeth and Elaine. And from pharmacy, we have Joey and myself here today to answer related questions. So I'll just share with you how to utilize um, the Q&A function. So if you look to the right, you'll actually see three tabs, which are the chats, Q&A and polls. For us to see your questions, do make sure you type your questions into the Q&A tab. Also, just a small tip. If you see a question that you would like for it to be answered, do make sure to click the little arrow below the question to upvote the question to make sure that um, all your questions will be answered. All right, so while we are waiting, for our participants to send in their questions. Uh, to start the ball rolling, perhaps I will ask the million dollar question which everyone is interested in, which is why did our fellow scholar ambassadors chose to take up their course that they are currently studying in? Any scholars would like to take the first question? I think I can share first. So um, my name is Joey and I'm a pharmacy student, year three pharmacy student from NUS. So the reason why I chose to join pharmacy uh, was because uh, in JC and actually in secondary school, uh, I was like always very interested in knowing how certain medications work in the body. Why like some medications can be used for like fever, why some are like antibiotic, why some are like for different conditions. And I wanted to know like how they work and like how our body actually deals with them and actually how the medication, yeah, how it works in general. Uh. So I was just always very curious about medications. So I read up more about pharmacy and I realized that, you know, the pharmacies actually deals a lot of medications and that's how my interest started uh, from there. All right. Thank you, Joey, for sharing. Um, anyone else from the other disciplines? So why did you choose to take up the course that you're currently studying in. Hi, I'm Li. I'm a year three physiotherapy student at uh, SIT. So one of the reasons why I took up physiotherapy was because um, I'm an athlete. So I've been an athlete since secondary school. So um, being an athlete comes with a lot of injuries. So at the same time, um, I can see a lot of my teammates going for physiotherapy sessions and like injuring um, their ligaments like um, ACL, meniscus, all those. So I guess, um, being on the ground in that sense um, is able to let me um, gain curiosity about what physiotherapy is as I see some of my friends go from like crutches back to um, the return of two sports. And uh, also I've went for like um, shadowing and at some hospitals when I was like in JC. So uh, it allowed me to understand better about what physiotherapy is compared to um, the, allied, uh, the other allied health professions. And um, yeah, it's what helped me ultimately decide to take up this course. Thanks, Li Yi, for sharing. So um, if the other scholars uh, uh, will not, does, does not have anything else to add, so first we will move on to uh, the questions in the Q&A. And wow, we have a lot of responses. Thank you for your active participation. So uh, right now we'll move on to the first question from the floor. Uh, it's actually related to um, diagnostic radiography. So um, unfortunately, today we don't have any speakers from um, the discipline, which is uh, DR. So um, perhaps maybe I'll, like, I'll just share like, a little more about other than tests, what do the DRs or radiographers do? And then the other speakers, if you have anything to add, so feel free to add on. 
Yeah. So for DRs, um, other than just X-ray testings, they're also uh, involved with um, other radiography equipment and investigations such as like CT scan, MR scan, and also um, ultrasound scans. So um, one of the main area uh, that radiographers are involved in is actually um, teleradiology. So it actually involves um, like transmission of radiographic images, um, any display or production of um, these um, findings or testing from uh, radiology. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately, because um, our speakers are all not from um, DR, so if you have any more questions, you can actually um, visit the Singapore Society of Radiographers uh, website. So they do have a lot more information and contacts that uh, you can reach out to to find out more about diagnostic radiography. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jai. Maybe I'll add on. So I'm not a DR also, but in the talk last Friday, right, or rather earlier, earlier in the week, there was a radiographer from CGH and she commented that, you know, there's also a DR role in the operating theater. So her answer was, we provide x-ray imaging for surgeons drilling metal implants into patients' bones. And also when they are doing things like removing kidney stones and so on amongst other operations. So I do think that there's a wide application for DR, not only uh, taking x-rays. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Nigel. So uh, if the other speakers have nothing else to add, uh, we will move on to the next uh, question. So uh, the next two questions is actually related. So um, the question is regarding, um, so the, the participant was asking, so as the treatment for many illnesses is actually a very long duration, so some patients might actually give up half time. So how do you, which is our, our healthcare professionals, deal with this? And how do you um, further encourage them? And to extension of this question, how do we ourselves as healthcare professionals cope and maintain positive throughout the long process of the treatment? Any speakers would like to answer? Maybe I can share a little bit on this. So uh, I've been to one of my clinical placements where I saw uh, patients who are on dialysis. So many of them are actually uh, for dialysis, mostly is uh, long term. So for those who need to go to NKF for uh, two times, two to three times uh, dialysis per week, sometimes it's, it's, it can be very uh, tiring for them. And I think for some of them, uh, because uh, when they are admitted to hospital, they have other comorbidities. So uh, a lot of time is actually uh, managing their expectations because uh, for patients who come in for, uh, for renal issues, sometimes mostly are long-term issues. So I think it's to really speak to them and then discuss and really know what are the discharge planning. And that's why it's very important for the, all the allied health professions to really communicate and make sure that we are on the same page. So that when we see the patient, we are telling the patient the same thing. And I think that's important. If not, the patient would be very confused as to what's the expectation, what's the discharge goal that, uh, that the patient uh, is able to meet. Lah. Okay, and I think uh, how, how, for, for the Ella Health side, how, how do we cope? Actually, uh, we have our friends and our colleague. So uh, actually on my placement, I actually saw some of the MOH uh, scholars, some of the nurses. La. So I think it was very, uh, it, was, it was very relief, like very relieving to, to, to see uh, fellow uh, Ella Health professions. So sometimes, you know, you have a bad day and you just need someone to talk to. You can just approach any of the colleagues and just, Talk to them like because they, they are in charge of the patients as well so i think you can share with them and i think most of the time they also face the same issues so they can talk to you and once you talk it out then you'll feel much better mm. yeah thank you jonathan for sharing yeah it's indeed um through that even from his, his experience we can also see that communication is key la. like whether is it between the patients and us our healthcare professionals or even between the healthcare professionals uh, sometimes just a little bit more uh, effective communication uh, can go a little bit more further as well. Yeah. So uh, we'll move on to the next question. So uh, this is actually related to um, community nursing. So uh, what can be done to patients who react um, aggressively um, towards uh, community nurses or 
generally uh, community nursing. So um, perhaps if uh, the other speakers would like to add in as well. So yeah, okay. Okay, so I will answer this question. Okay, so I'm Elaine from uh, year, um, year one from NUS Nursing. So basically for community nursing, as you guys know, it's really um, community. So basically we will be do house visits for the patients. So actually before they are being discharged from the hospital to receive this community nursing treatment, they, we were, the nurses in the hospital will actually go through the entire procedure with them. So making sure that they are really okay with it, they agree with the treatment itself. So um, if let's say the patient is okay, but they actually the patient is not very willing, actually what we will do is we will try to get the family members to help. Plus, you know, family members really play a big role in treatment for patients. So we will try to talk to the family member and then get the family member to encourage the patients to actually be open to community nursing as well. But most of the time, before they discharge, they will already be brief about how community nursing will work. And actually, community nursing is quite convenient for the patients. So most of them actually will not really react aggressively to it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, any other speakers would like to uh, add on? Perhaps um, may not be um, targeted to just community nursing. So. Uh, me myself, I'm also interested. Like whether any of y'all have any encounters where, um, patient do react ag aggressively or negatively, and um, how do you cope or like what are some measures that you have taken? Maybe I can take that. Uh, so hello, I'm Joanne from NYP Nursing Year One, uh, Year Two. Sorry, yeah. So um, actually, like I actually met patients who are, like very aggressive, like in terms of like the treatments of care, like. They were actually aggressive not really because um not really because they wanted to be angry at us. It's more like because they're worried about their condition and they don't know how to react and they're scared, like because they're in the hospital and they like see no light in that their treatment. So I think one way that we can cope with that is to really sit down and listen to them and understand the root of like their anger or like their problems. And also try to find a solution for it. Lah. So like example, I have a patient who was like um, very angry at us nurses because we were using like uh, additional materials to help him and then he thought that we were actually wasting the materials and adding the healthcare cost to him yeah so actually i think that um we should really understand like where the patients are coming from and like uh help them uh, like through like working with other healthcare professionals and like seeking the solution to their problems yeah thank you Julian, for sharing uh if um, other speakers have nothing else to add perhaps we'll move on to uh, the next question. So, uh, this question is specific to um, OT. So, uh, it's actually directed to Amy. So, um, can you share a little more about um, the OT course? Are the modules difficult to manage? Uh, hi, I'm studying occupational therapy at the University of Queensland. So, for the OT course, there's um, some basic courses like anatomy, which I think all healthcare professionals will have to go through. Other than that, um, we are more curious about OT specific modules. So, um, just a uh, uh, for OT, we look at of course one occupations, which are like activities, and then we look at the person and we look at the environment. So, a lot of our modules we um talk more about like what, how does like you know person affect the occupation? How does occupation affect the person? So, it's a lot about um investigating the relationships between um these three main um domains. That's what a lot of our OT courses are. And other than that, there's also a lot of like more clinically, like clinical practice kind of um, modules. There are a lot of um, also like knowledge building, like about the developmental milestones for children and about chronic conditions, things like that. Are they difficult to manage? Um, that definitely, uh, it's very knowledge-based, I think. No, and like health is easy to study because it's a lot of knowledge and a lot of the difficulty comes um, because it's very soft skill as well. Like it's easy to learn about like um, the experience of having a disability, but it's very hard to, when you're facing someone who actually has a disability, like how do you react? How do you um, transfer the knowledge? It's a very difficult thing. But I think if you have the passion, um, we have the drive to really understand your patient and be empath and to empathize with them, and it will make it very easy 
like yeah like everyone says anatomy is difficult but when you put it in perspective of how you will help your patient it really you will really learn to uh, like love it and understand and like yeah it won't be very difficult like it will be challenging but you can do it because you have the passion to push you through it yeah. hope, hope that helps thank you Amy you can tell that she's really very pass passionate about OT and uh so um, move on to the next question. So um, this is a general question. So um, all the scholar ambassadors from all disciplines can answer. So what is the best part about your profession and what inspired you to join? Maybe I can share for physiotherapies. So I think uh, in terms of the, you know, physiotherapy patients, when we see patients, uh, usually for physical function, and for patients who are in hospital, most of the time they came when when they come in, they are very weak, and so uh, when we do see them, actually, uh, they do improve quite a bit lah. So maybe from the first uh, day of admission, day one to say like just end of the the first week, we can actually see a big improvement. So actually. On the patient side, they do see some physical improvements. And I think on our side, it's, a, it's, it's not really a delayed gratification kind of thing. You, once someone can start you know, from, from just lying on the bed to walking, it's a very big difference. And I think these small things, for, for myself, I, I, I take it very seriously. And I think when, when they do see the difference, uh, they are very happy. And it's, it's the kind of satisfaction that you can't get from uh, jobs that are outside. Of healthcare and so I think that is the reason why I chose healthcare in the first place and then physiotherapy is like what uh, Li Ying say uh, a, a lot of us uh, you know have a sports background and then that's how we actually subsequently we thought that you know sports is the thing but actually once you go in the hospital you realize hey there's so much more and you want to do so much more than just you know your, your own interest but also what the current healthcare uh, needs. Uh. Thank you. So other scholars, would you like to share about your story about what is the best part about uh, your profession? I'm sure many of our participants are excited to hear what is the best part of your profession. Uh, maybe I can share also. So I think uh, the best part of being a nurse is actually to really see your patient uh, throughout the entire journey really getting better. So when they come in, they may feel like unwell, but when you nurse them back and like, you really get to know them, not just only do the skills that are required of you, uh, part of the job, the entire job scope, but actually getting to know them, getting to hear them out. I think that's a very, very big honor for them to, to actually gain their trust and when they share with us that kind of thing I think that really inspires me because I believe that everybody comes in with a story um, it's much deeper than what's on the surface so actually getting to hear them and um, just seeing what I can do to help um, maybe a small thing or big thing but as long as we can help I think that really inspires me to just uh, do my best and actually just continue to care for my patient and caring to go beyond uh, yeah so it's not just about performing the skills is also getting to know our patient on an individual and providing them like very personalized care and yeah just um doing the best we can uh, in the position we are in yeah thank you elizabeth and jonathan for sharing it's indeed very inspiring why um they chose to join uh, their respective disciplines um maybe we'll move on to the next question so uh, this question is directed to pharmacists or pharmacy students so uh, what if the patient does not remember the name of the medication that the patient is taking? And um, there is a possibly, possible conflict in medications, and what will you do? Mm, actually, it's pretty common for patients to not remember the names of medications because the medication names can be really long and very hard to pronounce and things like that. So it's actually very common. So, but what we will do is we will ask whether the patient... Uh, has brought along the medications with them, then we can take a look. Or maybe they have like pictures in their phone or, or whatever, so they can refer to all these kind of things. Yeah, and if the medication is at home, then, you know, we can always give a call. If it's a caregiver, we can always talk to the caregiver to ask, or oh, what, what medications is this person taking? Or like a family relative or something like that. 
Yeah. And if there's a possible conflict in medications, which is also very common, um, it's actually a drug related uh, problem. So what we will do is we will usually we'll have to call the doctor to uh, intervene and um, have a chat with the doctor uh, to tell him um, our assessment, like why we think there's a, there's a possible conflict. Maybe the dose is wrong or like two medications cannot be used together and things like that. So we'll tell him the situation and then have him to assess the situation as well. And then we will recommend to the doctor, okay, what, what should we do about it? And then from there, uh, we will both come up with the best uh, possible uh, medication and care plan for that patient. Yeah, so that's what we will do. Lah. Thank you, Joey. So or maybe I'll just add on a little. So personally, when I was on one of my attachments and the problem of a patient not remembering, re not remembering the name of the medication actually occurred to me. So the patient once walked up to me and said that he was taking a white pill. And there are many, many, many white pills medication in this world. And we really had a hard time trying to find out um, what medication he was taking. He doesn't have any photos, no names, no dose or anything. And so we had to start from the basic and we just asked him, okay, so um, where you got the medication from? So what are you taking the medication for? How long you have been taking? And say like, um, which doctor do you visit to get the medication from? Perhaps you have to call the clinic to ask. Yeah, stuff like that. So uh, most importantly, we have to talk to the patient to find out Okay, so why is his background, his medical history as such, which was actually portrayed in um, the case studies um, prior to this. Yeah. So um, maybe before we move on to the next question, I would just like to remind everyone that um, due to time constraint, right, we might not be able to answer all the question posted. Therefore, if you see a question that you would like for it to be answered, make sure to click the little arrow below the question to upvote the question. So the questions can be seen and then will be answered faster. Yeah. So for the next question, um, can you give us some advice on beefing our portfolio, um, such as what voluntary activities you guys participated in, etc. Maybe I'll take that question. Honestly, it's not beefing our portfolio. I think a lot of like scholars we have a lot of volunteering experience and it helps us in a way because as i mentioned a lot of about healthcare is the soft skills and the communication and volunteering is one way to sort of practice that so that's why um a lot of us do have volunteer experience and um, that's how we, like, it's a way for us to practice that so it's not really like beefing up our portfolio like it doesn't mean you do like the most hours in singapore means you become like a scholar it doesn't work that way. Yeah, so there's no like sure fire like portfolio style that will get you uh, into healthcare or into a scholarship. Yeah, so I'll, I would say that the best way is just to find your passion and just be very curious about it. Do a lot of research, ask around about it. And yeah, volunteer if you want because that really does help with like soft skills in communication and empathizing which are very essential skills um, as a healthcare profession so even if you don't become a scholar even if you want to do anything else these are all very essential skills for you to learn so you should just volunteer not for the portfolio but to sort of enrich yourself thank you Engie. anyone else would like to share about any portfolio tips If no one else would like to uh, talk more about um, um, portfolio, then it's okay. Perhaps we'll move on to the next question. So, um, are online self-diagnosing um, platforms actually reliable like WebMed? I think for um, all these kinds of websites, right? Um, there are actually a lot of layers you must consider first. So you must first consider how credible is the website, uh, who wrote the article, what is the background of that person who wrote, who wrote the article, is he a doctor or is he just some random guy on the internet? And uh, you must also see like what is the purpose of the website, whether they receive any 
um, advertise, I mean like money for advertisement and things like that. So all these are things to consider about how credible the website is. Um, uh, you might also, actually these websites, right, in my opinion, cannot replace the role of the doctor to diagnose patients uh, because all these websites, right, they usually, even if they are credible, they usually say things like in general. So they say like, okay, generally patients, like for example, who have cancer will have all these symptoms, but it may not occur to every patient and it has to be individualized to that, to, to a, to that particular patient. And um, your doctor will also perhaps perform many like lab tests to have you um, assess like maybe your, your kidney function and things like that. So there'll be a lot more things to consider as well. So it's not just based on symptoms that you see from all these websites, then it means that you have a certain condition. Yeah, so it's always best to go and uh, go and see a doctor to have you really like properly assessed. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So um, anyone, think, anyone else have anything to add? If not, then uh, let's move on to the next question. So what is the toughest challenge you have faced with patients and how do you overcome it? I think I can take this one. So like for, um, because I'm only a year one, so I've only been to one attachment and my attachment was actually at a nursing home. So the nursing home, all the Akong and Ama there are actually, mostly are dementia patients. So they're actually confused. So when I was um, attending to this Akong, he was, um, he was, uh, yeah, he has dementia. So when I attend to him, I think because I was really foreign to him and then he's also in a confused state. So actually he thought I was going to like, harm him or in some other way like I'm, like I'm going to be a bad person to him when I was just trying to like apply some cream for him so actually he got aggressive like he he started to scold me and then started to you know like like try to push me away because I was applying the cream so actually um it was my first time experiencing as a as a student nurse so actually I was quite worried and all but then um, like my senior staff nurse or they are actually quite nice they come over to you know render help for me and then I just took a step back because as a healthcare professional we are not I mean it's really it's all about professionalism I mean obviously we feel some distress at that point of time but then we just have to step back and then really just calm yourself down don't let your emotions take over you because ultimately you have to understand and be in their shoes that it's not that they didn't did it intentionally yeah, so I think for most of us, it's really about, you know, taking a step back and really calm ourselves down. And then after that, when I calm myself down, after, you know, my senior staff nurse attend to him and apply the cream for him, I went back to him. He was actually like smiling and being happy to me again. So it's really, really just putting yourself into, their, into your patient's shoes and then really understanding why they're reacting in that way in that point of time. Yeah. Thanks, Elaine. Actually, I want to share also. So my grandfather had dementia also but he didn't react in a very violent way he actually thought he was a 10 year old kid and I think during his time they had the world war two right so Japanese occupation so he started running around and saying there were bombs so same thing here right uh, the most important thing is the patient care and really taking a step back and uh, you know taking on the feet and you know looking at the situation and reacting to them in a compassionate and calm way i think that is the most important same with elaine right after that he would come down he was nice he was back to normal in that sense so i think that gave uh caretakers a lot of hope it gave my parents it gave my relatives a lot of hope that you know they could still live with him although he was like a small child but i think that rest satisfaction i think is what all of them here are looking towards and looking forward to Thank you, Nigel and Elaine, for sharing, uh, especially some tips for us that uh, to take note of when, um, let's say, next time we are dealing with uh, patients. So, anyone else would like to share? I think I totally agree with what they said. Because sometimes, you, you know, you do see difficult patients and you do see patients with a lot of disabilities, especially with elderly, they have long lists of comorbid, uh, co comorbids. So, uh, in my time when I when I was uh, in the hospital, actually I see patients with twenty over conditions. It's, some is uh, some are big, some are small. But then when I first saw it, I was like, "Wow, so many conditions. Which one should I focus?" You know, it's like, it's a bit it's a bit scary, la. But after that, uh, my clinical educator actually tell me, you know, uh, 
from a physiotherapist's perspective, once you deem as uh, you know those those issues are resolved and there's no safety issue, you actually have those conditions in mind to really understand what the patient is currently feeling. Because sometimes uh, you you cannot solve the twenty issues, the twenty condition that your patient has. But what you can do is really empathize and put yourself in your patient's shoe. You know, imagine you have twenty conditions. How would you feel? And so if you can really empathize how they are feeling and before you see them, uh, when you actually, you know, go for the session and, and see them, sometimes they react a bit more differently. You, you kind of could understand a bit better and you won't like just, you know, like, uh, why, why is he not complying? You may understand, oh, because you know, he has cancer, you know, have certain conditions. That's why it's low mood. So you, if, if you go, if you see a patient from that perspective, then uh, a lot of time you, you wouldn't have a very difficult time now because you understand and you can, you can make peace with yourself as well. Lah. Correct. All right. Thanks, Jonathan, for sharing. So um, due to time constraint, perhaps we will move on to the last few questions. So um, this, the last few questions will be pertaining to uh, PTOT. So um, this question is asking, is it safe to say that a PTOT can do the same treatment and patients can see either a PT or OT, but not necessarily both? Yeah, uh, okay, I guess it's me. Uh, no, we don't do the same treatment specifically. So, um, in like, okay, just now the case of Mrs. X driving. Driving is the occupation, and that's what um, OTs do. We do the activity. But before, like, Mrs. X could even drive, right, she needed to regain, like, ankle mobility, ankle range of motion. And these are things our physiotherapist colleagues do. I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you, we do need to see both um, at different points of time, sometimes at the same time. So we do work together and we don't do the exact same type of treatments. It's just that we do have the same goal in the end, which is to help her go back to her independent, um, like to her occupation, in this case of Mrs. X of driving. So we have similar, um, we have similar goals, so we do similar things, but our treatment is completely different. And yeah, sometimes we see um, Mrs. X at different points of time. Yeah. I totally agree with uh, Amy. I think uh, we do different things and we, a lot of time, we need to really communicate the, the discharge planning together. And because once that is clear, I think, you know, however way we want to do it is, is okay because the end goal is the same. La. And I think that's, uh, that's Thanks, uh, Ingi and Jonathan. So I hope um, the participants had a better understanding of uh, the difference between PT and OT. So um, the next question is um, to Jonathan. So um, do you do home visit for patients with follow-up care and uh, but who have difficulty leaving the house? And also a similar question actually for OT. So since you need to assess the living or working environment of the patient, does it mean that you need to travel to the homes or workplaces of the patients instead of being stationed uh, in the hospital? So basically, um, it's asking about the PT and OT. So where, to what extent do their uh, job, stop, job scope goes to? So that's a very good question. So... Uh... For physiotherapists, aside from acute hospital, for the community side that you are saying, right, uh, there, there are follow-ups, uh, physios who are in charge of such uh, follow-up sessions. Now. So it's called home therapy. So uh, in the community setting, there are, uh, there are physiotherapists who are in charge of patients who are able to ambulate to the hospital or the community hospital to see the physiotherapist. And for those who, like you said, cannot ambulate uh, to the, or, or do not have the transport to the from uh, hospital, then uh, the physios do go for uh, home visits. Yeah, but usually they would uh, be in a small team now. So not just the physiotherapist, but also the occupational therapist or even uh, nurses as well. Uh, yeah, so like Jonathan said, we do have um, 
different types of OT. So yes, there's community OTs that will work with the community PTs at their home to do home-based therapy. Otherwise, there's also OTs at the hospital and we do, um, there are things that we can do at the hospital itself. So like things like fine motor skills, so like your fingers, um, writing or even like cognitive stuff like money management, whether you can memorize your shopping list, whether you can remember, like, whether you know how to take transport. These are things we can also work from uh, also like now there's like tele telehealth also so like it doesn't always mean that we need to travel there are also different ways of doing it and there's different types of ot's and different types um different sectors you can go to based on your interests and yeah things like that i think to add on also right uh the otpt role in the community is a bit different because the patients are older and they often have quite bad mobility. So what I've seen in the community setting so far is a few of them PTOT nurses all helping together. Because for example, if you're helping a frail man walk and he cannot walk by himself, right? You need to support his weight. So I think there's a lot going on in the community. Thank you, Nigel, um, Jonathan and Amy for sharing. So. Um, due to time constraint, we will actually move on to our last question. So thank you everyone for all your party, uh, active participation. So um, I would like to just remind everyone that you can always find out more information about healthcare scholarships on our website, um, healthcarescholarships.com.sg. Or if you have any further questions, feel free to email us at talent at mohh.com.sg. So for the last question, um, given the multidisciplinary approach um, towards patient care, do you often um, face differences between different professions when coming up with a diagnosis or treatment plan? Sorry, maybe I can answer that. I think uh, many times, most of the times, you we we don't have a conflict. We we don't have conflicts, lah. You know. But uh, I think that's the reason why we work as a team. So uh, in, in the healthcare, you need to be a team player. La. You cannot think that whatever you think, like as a physiotherapist, I, I wouldn't think that what I think is always correct. I will have a, we, we usually have uh, this thing called the MDM. So it's a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary meeting. And so there's doctors, there's the, all the other health professions that uh, during the icebreaker I've shared. So during those meetings, you actually get to hear from different uh, professions and then you really understand the condition. And then from there, then you make a suggestion. Ultimately, the doctor will actually uh, make the final call. Yeah, I think like what Jonathan said, that in any team, there'll definitely be conflict. But I think also we kind of understand each other that, you know, we all have the patient's interest in mind. It's just that because of the different ways that we are taught, we have different like focus. That's why sometimes we do have conflict in how we want the treatment to go or how we see the treatment plan to be. But because we also understand we, we that we all have the patient like in mind, we can talk it out and we can like sort of negotiate and understand each other's perspective because we, we just have one, we have one similar goal in the end for the patient. So yeah, there's conflicts, but it can be resolved. Thank you uh, to our speakers for answering all the questions um, posted by our participants. Uh, I hope that it has been a really uh, informative and uh, a very informative Q&A session for everyone. So um, just like to remind everyone again, you can always find out more information on our website, healthcarescholarship.com.sg. Or if you have any further questions, feel free to email us at talent at mohh.com.sg and we will make sure to get back to you as soon as possible. It was a very big pleasure for, to have everyone online and thank you all for your questions and joining Walking in Our Healthcare Professional Shoes. Yep. Thank you, Jiang. Thank you, scholars, for planning this session. Uh, like Tang mentioned, we have come to the end of the session. So please take a few seconds to read the program at the bottom left of your screen. So coming up next uh, week, we have a couple of events that focus on Comcare. We'll have Rensu Hospital on Monday, NTUC Health on Tuesday, and St. Luke's Elder Care on Wednesday. So don't miss this great opportunity to find out more about the Comcare sector. 
Until then, have a good Sunday. Have a great weekend. Stay safe and see you tomorrow at 10.30. Thank you, everyone.